All right. Hey, what, what I like on Time Change Weekend, which by the way, here's what I love about social media. This week, I found out that time was changing. And did you know that gas prices are high? <laughs> it's like... I just want to, it's like when it gets really cold, you know, when it's like that negative seven morning, everybody reminds you on social. It's like, I know, I live here. I know how cold it is outside. You don't have to tell me this. And so same thing on time change. Like, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be brutal. It's time. Did you know it's time? Change? I was like, yeah, because I have an iPhone and I don't have to change my clocks. It wakes me up. This is 2022. We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, right. And, uh, and yes, if you filled up this week, you know that gas prices are high. Did you need to be reminded online that gas prices were high? Right. It just sent me into a tailspin. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I promise I won't do that the whole time. Hey, uh, finish this statement for me. What have you done for me? Okay, so you know the Janet Jackson song as well, right? So, some of you may not even know that was a Janet Jackson song, but you do know what have you done for me lately, right? Uh, it was actually uh, written for another singer. This was a 1985 song, so I was five, um, which ages me just a little bit, right? And uh, it, like half the room is like, man, I got no idea. I wasn't born then. And uh, the other half is like, yes, I was. And, uh, but it was written in 1985, actually for another uh, singer, another kind of vocal artist. Uh, but Janet Jackson had recently gone through a divorce and they believed that it would be better for her. She actually heard about it, liked it, believed it would be better because it represented the relationship that she was in in a what have you done for me lately mentality that she felt she was being disrespected by her significant other. Um, Libby and I actually watched the video. <laughs> if you just want to go back and watch videos, it's really hilarious. Uh, but that song and that phrase really isn't just a... Jackson, what have you done for me lately type of thing, right? This is really the world that we live in, right? The tension with that statement is that we live in a what have you done for me lately world. This is not just a song that comes to mind, right? Uh, hey, Chris, will you help me with this thing? And if we're being honest, when someone asks for our help or when someone wants to kind of be over here and, and give advice or do, do things in that area with you, one of your first thoughts is, Hmm, what has this person done for me lately, right? What has this person done here? Maybe there's something in us that goes, all right, I want to I know what I'm going to receive on my end for helping out in this area. Uh, we live in a me-centered world that really looks at our current circumstances more than anything else, right? Kind of in the here and now to determine what our life looks like today. We live in the here and now in our current circumstances to tell you how life is or is not going. You know, things like dedication and faithfulness, commitment, and so much more has kind of gone out the window a little bit. Live in what have you done for me lately world? And I, can I tell you something? I don't, I don't know if we really want to admit this, but we're in church on a Sunday morning, so I think it would be nice for us to admit it, um, that we do the same thing in our relationship with God. We do the same thing in our relationship with God. No matter where we are in our current reality or whatever is going on in our life, we look at what God has done or is doing or is not doing, and we kind of go, what have you done for me lately, Lord? And, and that's like, that's real, and that's a little bit heavy, but whether you're a follower of Jesus in the room or maybe you're here processing your thoughts about Christianity, if we're being really honest, we tend to sometimes fall into this, what have you done for me lately world? When it comes to our relationship with the Lord, you may be deep in the middle of a broken relationship with family or whoever else that may be. And you go, hey, where are you at now, God? Uh, you may be looking for the job situation that is something that is not what you're currently in now. And you're going, hey, where, where are you at, God? Why are you not in this job situation? Maybe a marriage is struggling and you're going, hey, God, why would you let it get this way? Maybe kids are going wayward in some type of way, and you're going, hey, God, why would you let my kids do these types of things? Help me, Lord, now. The reality is that when we do this, if, if we're being really honest, we're viewing God based on and dependent upon our circumstances. That's our view of God. We're, we're viewing our God based on and dependent upon our circumstances. See, good circumstances, then, man, he's a good God, right? Bad circumstances, what are you doing, Lord? Where are you? And if we really want to be honest, that's where we are at times, right? And the truth is, and 
What I want you to remember today, if you're walking out of here, if you're walking away with one thing that I want you to remember, it's this. Don't view God in light of your circumstances, but view your circumstances in light of your God. So don't view God in light of your circumstances, but we need to shift and think about our circumstances in light of our God. If you have a copy of the Bible, do me a favor and turn to Numbers chapter 13. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 today. If you're new to the Bible, uh, that's on the left-hand side. It's about 100 pages in somewhere, depending on the Bible that you own, but it's in the Old Testament portion of the Bible. It's the fourth book of the Bible. We made it through Leviticus, so that's good, um, And uh, right? And so we if you're new with us this morning, we are in a series that we're doing all year long called The Story. Uh, and so The Story is a look at the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We're walking through that. And then there's little kind of sub-segments sub within that as well, right? We just finished an Out of Darkness as the Israelites fled slavery and en enslavement, right? And, and now we're going into this Above All series that we're starting here. And Above All means that we're going to see people and we're going to see a God that wants his people to live for him above all and above everything else. We want to see their, their dedication and their faithfulness, right? So if you have that copy, you can turn to Numbers chapter uh, 13. Uh, if you don't have a copy, Adam mentioned the QR code. By the way, you can scan that QR code. It goes directly to Numbers 13 this morning as well as some message notes on version that app. Uh, you can also find out several other things on the, the QR code and, and that information with events. Uh, you can register kids for camps. You can do all those uh, sorts of things on there. Find out what we're doing. And you can also give back to God through uh, the Journey Point app as well and that giving link that's on there. But here's what I want to do. I want to catch you up just real quickly as we get to Numbers chapter uh, 13. Um, God's people have been rescued right? Um, and Adam did a great job last week talking about restoration. We have Moses, uh, this leader of them. They've been rescued from slavery. Um, they've been sent into their wilderness, and they're going to find the promised land, right? So this is land that has been promised to them. So it's called the promised land. It's really good. It's really creative, right? And uh, I like that. Kind of, I'm not creative guys. So I'm like, what would we call this land? The promised land, right? Because it's the land that has been promised to them. It's Canaan, right? So they're, they're on their way to find that. Some ground rules have been established, right? We talked about the Ten Commandments and Leviticus lays some ground rules and those types of things have been established. They, they've been given food to eat, right? They had manna. And, and unlike us today that that never complain or never do anything like that, right? Unlike the world that we live in today, these people were complaining people, right? And so they have food, literally did nothing and the food came to them and they had food every day. And you know what they did? They were like, eh, this food isn't good enough. And, and I want something better. Give me some meat, right? And so what happens? Quail falls from the sky. It's like, all right, hey Lord, I want some filet mignon and there's filet mignon for these people, right? And it's like, man, like everything they, like God has promised so much to them and everything is going just as God has said. They're being provided for. They're being protected. God is leading them. He's given them a leader in Moses to do these things. And like these people have everything at their disposal and they're not doing anything for it. God is just continuing to provide. But shockingly, they keep complaining because they're looking at the here and now of their circumstances, right? And they keep doing that. They keep thinking, hey, God, what have you done for me lately? What have you done for me today to meet my needs and my wants and my desires? But even in the midst of this, God shows them compassion and leads them to the cusp of this promised land. Like they're, they're ready. It's like, hey man, here it is. Like we're sitting on G and O and ready to go in and it's yours for the taking. We're here. We're ready. I've promised you this land flowing with milk and honey and everything else. And these people are here getting ready to enter into the land that God has provided for them. So we're going to cover a lot of ground in Numbers 13 and 14 this morning. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is uh, kind of unlike I normally do, I'm just going to kind of read through it and then highlight there's three significant points in these two chapters that I think God shows us when it comes to identifying what our circumstances look like in view of our God and having to view our circumstance in light of our God instead of our God in light of our circumstances, right? There's going to be three points that we will see that come out of the text from that. So here's what we're going to do. Let's open it a word of prayer and then just drive straight into Numbers chapter 13. Father, we love you. Uh, we thank you for who you are. God, everything that you have done for us, and man, much like these Israelites, we're kind of a complaining group of people too. Um, and we sometimes just don't know any better. And Father, forgive us for that, because sometimes, far too many times, we view our circumstances more than we view our relationship with you. 
Sometimes we may even thought, what have you done for me lately? Where are these answers to this prayer? Why aren't you answering them the way that I would love for them to be answered? And so God, forgive us of that and let us lean into the good and gracious and compassionate and providing and faithful God that you are. Do the work that only you can through your word this morning. We love you. We praise you. And it's in your name. Amen. Hey, if you're ready to hear from the word, say word. word. All right, let's go. That's more awake than I thought you were going to be for Time Change Sunday, okay? Uh, say it one more time. Let's just let's feel good. If you're ready to hear from the word, say word. word. All right. Numbers 13, verse 1 and 2 to start off with. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses. This is the Lord speaking to Moses. Send men to scout out the land of Canaan. This is the promised land, Canaan. Send men to scout out the land of Canaan. I am giving to the Israelites. Send one man who is a leader among them from each of their ancestral tribes. He's given it to them. It's the land they're promised. He says, send one man from each of these tribes, a leader at that point, right? So it's like, okay, boys, get ready. Here we go. Here we are. We're ready to go in, right? This land that I've been promising is here, and we're on the cusp of it. Let's get excited about doing it. Can't you just imagine, like, the excitement of the camp? Like, hey, we've been traveling. We have no idea what's going on. And then Moses comes back and says, hey, man, God spoke to me. We're going to get these leaders. We're on the verge of going in the land. We're here, and, and we're going to get ready to go in, and I want you to go scout out this land for us to see if it's really as good as what God said it was going to be. And so there's excitement all around this camp. And so these 12 scouts are selected, leaders are selected, it says. And so we know that these weren't just random people, but like these were leaders in this group of people, right? And two of them are to note, and I'll just be honest, the other 10 we can forget about. <laughs> because the other 10, you'll find out, don't have a whole lot to give to this story. They do, they can give us some perspective, but two of them are very significant. A guy named Caleb and a guy named Joshua, or H Hosea. And then turned into Joshua. Caleb, man, Caleb is born in Egypt as a slave. And his, lay, his name literally meant dog. Like, he's a dog. And I don't know about you, but when you read about Caleb, I kind of think of like, have you ever heard the phrase like, he's a junkyard dog? Right? Like, he's just a, and, and I'm a sports guy, so this is a sports reference. You want guys on your basketball team that are junkyard dogs, right? They're just gritty. They're grindy. They're going to get after it. I'm a University of Tennessee graduate who is playing in the championship today against Texas of the SEC conference. And we've got a guy that's a freshman. He is a junkyard dog. Like, he is just, he's way beyond his years. He's gritty, grindy, getting after it. He's probably the one in the huddle always going, all right, let's go. If we're... Denver Broncos fans, we got a junkyard dog this week. His name was Russell Wilson. We have a quarterback, right? And it's like, can't you just imagine like Russell Wilson in the huddle going, yeah, let's go, guys. It's time to go out there and get the win. And that's who Caleb is. We'll find out a little bit more about that in a minute. But Joshua, this is Moses' protege. He is a military leader of military leaders. This is a guy that God is doing and will do great work through, right? Right? My, uh, Moses actually changes his name. If you go down to verse 16, it says, these were the names of the men Moses sent to scout out the land. And Moses renamed Hosea, to, uh, son of Nun, to Joshua. So Hosea was Joshua's original name, and it meant he saves. Now, the he saves is not God saves. It meant that he, who is the, the name bearer, right, Joshua, would have been the one that can save people. And so Moses says, no, 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 no. I'm going to change your name. Jewish belief says that he changed his name because he knew that the other 10 people were going to react in the way that we're going to find out the way they reacted in a minute. And so he wanted to change Joshua's name to Yahweh saves, which is what Joshua means. And so it goes from he being Joshua saves to no, 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 God saves, right? And so we see this name change. And these are two very significant people that we need to watch as this story unfolds. But they're not sent to do something that they're not in tune with what their task was because Moses actually gives them the task. Look at verse 18 through 20. It says this, see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or or weak, few, or many? Is the land they live in good or bad? Are the cities they live in encampments or fortifications? Is the land fertile or unproductive? Are there any trees or not? And then catch this. This is a command. Be courageous. Say that with me. Be courageous. 
right? One more time. Be courageous. Bring back some fruit from the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. And here's a truth that comes out of this. He says, bring back this fruit. Bring back some product from the land. And when we're walking in our circumstances that aren't what we want them to be, one of the truths that we need to realize is that seeing the product should strengthen the promise. Okay? So God has promised so many things to them. And if we will see the product that God gives us, we can be strengthened in the promise that God continues to give us. Right? And so many times when when we don't see the fruit, or when we see the fruit, we still debate whether or not God is good enough to provide in a certain way, right? And by the way, product isn't what you want to be, the job you want to have, the relationship to be mended. Can I tell you something? You all made it here on time change weekend, which means you're either early risers or super committed, or maybe both. But you're alive, you're breathing, you have clothes, there's coffee, you probably had food at some point. Those are products of God's faithfulness to you. And those products of God's faithfulness to you should make you lean into the promises that God has for you even more so, right? Don't think of the, pro- the products that he hasn't given you yet, but think of what you have in your life right now. When you see the products that you have in your life right now, You should be strengthened in the promise that God continues to give. Maybe you've heard it this way. A bird in the hand is better than two in the bush, right? Yeah. Like a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. Proof is in the pudding. Put your money where your mouth is, right? These are things we know. It's saying, hey, walk the walk and talk the talk. These products should make us lean into who we are and what God has called us to be. Said this way, and I say it a lot, God's past faithfulness is always an indicator of his current and his future faithfulness in your life. Like if you have God's past faithfulness in your life, it is an indicator that God is faithful to provide today and also that he is going to provide in the future as well. God's past faithfulness is an indicator of the present and future faithfulness. Your current circumstance should not automatically make you think that God will not provide going forward. Your current circumstance should not make you think that that promise will not be there, that he has promised that it would be, right? And when we see the product, we can trust in the promise. But um, as you might imagine, that wasn't the case for these Israelites. See, these 10 come back, and if you follow along in chapter 13, verse 26, it says this. It says, the men went back to Moses, Aaron, and the entire Israelite uh, community in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back a report for them and the whole community, and they showed them the fruit of the land. So God has said, I'm going to provide you this fruit, and then they bring back this fruit, so clearly they're going to be excited about what God had promised them to do later on, right? Wrong. If you keep reading, it says this. They reported to Moses. We went into the land you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. I don't ever eat milk with honey, but I think that's a good thing back then, right? Maybe you do. Maybe you you have like a latte that has milk and honey in it too, right? Honey latte, okay. Uh, I'm just a black coffee guy. But they were promised milk and honey. They come back and said it is indeed flowing with milk and honey, and here is some of its fruit. And verse 28 says, however... Say the word however, right? In our vocabulary, that's like, but, although, nonetheless, you know, we we say these words often. We don't think they have a lot of meaning, but follow along. It says, however, the people living in the land are strong, and the cities are large and fortified. We also saw the descendants of Anak there. So God said it was going to be fruitful, and it was fruitful. God said there would be milk and honey. There was milk and honey. God said it would be productive, and it was productive. However, it wasn't quite what we wanted it to be. We thought it would be a little bit easier than what we're looking at. We wanted to just slide right through. We wanted it to be perfect and not a lot of resistance for us. What have you done for me lately, God? Because I saw big, strong people there, and apparently their God wasn't as strong as the people were. And so they come back and they say, God, I thought it would be easier in this. They were trusting in their circumstance more than they were trusting in God. But look at my junkyard dog, Caleb, verse 30. So you can tell it's loud because in the very beginning of this, Caleb, it says, then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses. So like these people are not just saying, well, I don't know if we can do it. They're like in an uproar. 
They're fully believing they cannot go into this land because there are bigger, stronger people there. That even though God's products was there, even though the proof was in the pudding of what he promised them, these people are going, we cannot do this. And so much that they're loud. And Caleb says, let's quiet down. But now he says, let's go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it, right? He's in the huddle rallying the troops to say, hey, I know that they look big and strong, but guess what? My God is stronger. I know that it looks like we can't overcome them, but guess what? God said that we can. I know that these people are there, but God said that he would give it to us. Let's get after it and go. But this is, this is not what transpires, right? The people said they couldn't because they were stronger. They were still caught in fear. Their God, Yahweh, who had gotten them to where they were with all the food, with all the provision, with all the promises fulfilled, were only as big as their current circumstance. Like, how big is your God, church? Is he only as big as the current circumstance that you're in? Is your God that you serve only as big as the current reality that's going on around you right now? And too many times, I think we think of God in terms of our current reality and what is going on in our life here and now. And man, that's a really small God. And the God that we serve is way bigger than that. And for these Israelites, their circumstance not only made them question how big God was, but whether or not they were even being led by the right people in Moses and Aaron and others. Look what it says at the beginning of chapter 14. So Caleb speaks up, and so now it's like, okay, Caleb, maybe you're right, Caleb, but uh, maybe Caleb's not the right leader, and he's under Moses, and so maybe that's not there. I know your leadership has never been questioned, but just imagine leadership is being questioned here, right? It says, then the whole community broke into loud cries. That didn't dissipate their fears. It actually, like, it rose them up even higher. It says, and the people wept that night. Like, not only are they crying, but like, not only are they loud, but they're crying about how are they going to overcome this. Verse 2 says, all the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron, and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Like, let's stop for just a second and realize where these people are. They would rather be dead at the hands of Egyptians or dead in the wilderness than to face something that God said they can face and that he would overcome. Like, that's where these people are. They're literally questioning whether or not they should have just died before then so they didn't have to walk into a land that had strong people in it. Verse 3 says, why is the Lord bringing us into the land to die by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Like, wouldn't it be better for us to go back into slavery than to try to figure something out with God who said he's already got it figured out? And then in verse 4, it says, so they said to one another, Let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. <laughs> like they're, they're now wrestling with who's leading them. But guys, seeing the products that God gives us should strengthen that promise, and it should remove any fears that we have. And this really brings up kind of point number two out of this text is that your fears should not outweigh your faith. Like, I don't know what current situation that you're in, but like, we've heard this before, right? Faith over fear. Like, there's shirts, there's bumper stickers, social media, faith, line, fear, right? Your fears should never outweigh your faith in who God is. In the midst of walking with God in the wilderness, with him coming through time and time again, these people were letting their fears overcome the belief that their God could do what he said he was going to do. And man, this crushed Moses and Aaron and Caleb and Joshua. Matter of fact, they come through and they're like, all right, this is enough. Like we can't have you all living this way with the God that we serve and the God that we know has come through time and time again. They said, hey, your faith should overcome your fear. Your faith should not be small. He reminds them who is in charge and that through God, our fears are minuscule in the big picture of things, right? Look at verse five. It says, and Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole assembly of the Israelite community. Like they're broken over this. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were, uh, who were among those who scouted out the land, they tore their clothes. That was a sign of like being really, really distraught in these times, right? It was grief when they tore clothes like this. And they said to the entire Israelite community, 
The land we passed through and explored is an extremely good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he'll do what? Give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. Don't let your fear overcome your faith, for we will devour them. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them, they cry out. While the whole community threatened to stone them, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tent of meeting. Like the way they were responding with God's glory in mind, with faith in him, it brought in his presence, right? Faith, I mean, fear removes God's presence. Faith brings in God's presence with these people. You see, for these men, theocracy, which is like belief in the power of God and him doing what he says he's going to do, always overcomes majority rules, right? And this is hard because we now live in a majority rules culture right? If the loudest voices can get together and become loud voices, now all of a sudden we can craft narratives and everybody can believe this narrative because it's a majority culture saying this narrative, right? Turn on Fox News or CNN and you'll just see what I'm talking about, right? Two totally different shows, two totally different majority rules, two totally different narratives they're creating, right? And this is the world that we live in, but man, Moses, Aaron, Caleb, Joshua, they don't live in a majority rules culture, They live in a theocracy in the belief that the power of God is able to overcome a majority rules culture. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't live ever in a a a democratic type of way, right? It doesn't mean that they throw that out the water. Moses really did. Like, he brought in helpers. He had all of these people come in in Exodus 18 and leaders and make decisions alongside of him. But in this particular thing where God's promises are very real and true, no chance that they're going to just lean into majority rules culture. And man, it's the same thing we live in now. Like, I wrote down a couple of examples. Like, fearful of where our country is headed. There's a majority rules there. Fearful of what leaders are saying or doing. There's majority cultures there that are saying things. There's majority cultures that believe science and don't believe science and then believe science when it applies to them and don't believe science when it doesn't apply to them, right? It's on both sides. There's no commonality between it, which is why believing in the power of God is probably more important than believing in any of those majority rules cultures, right? There's people that are fearful of statistics. Are these statistics right or are these statistics right, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what we're in or what category there is. We have majority rules type of narratives that are being played and thrown at us left and right. And I don't care what the majority it is in that area. As followers of Jesus, we have to maintain that our fear can never outweigh our faith. Never outweigh our faith. I I said this at one point, whether you have like It's like gun control or non-gun control, right? You have people that are like, okay, we need it, but I'm still going to lock my doors and and set my alarms and all these things. Well, hold on. If you need faith over, if faith is over fear and you don't have to have this over here, then you don't have to have these things. Or if it's, it's, it doesn't matter which side of the equation that we're on. It doesn't make sense. It never lines up. But you know who does? God. Every single time. By the way, this was so bad for Caleb and Joshua that they tore their clothes, right? And here's the question to you. Are you ever seeing people that their faith is fading and in that you lament for them, right? Because sometimes what we do is we start to judge and we start to throw uh, kind of, well, you know, I wondered where they were, right? I wondered what their belief was. But Caleb and Joshua are not just sitting there going, oh, I wondered where they would be, but they're lamenting over a faith that is waning with this group of people. These are people that they led. These are people that they walked with. And in walking with them and doing these types of things, when they see their faith fading, it hurt Caleb and Joshua, right? Don't let that slip by. When you see someone, when their faith is fading, it should make you mourn that their faith is fading. And one reason is because When our faith fades, it makes a watching world that doesn't believe think that God is not real, right? Look at verses 15 through 17. This is in the middle of Moses really like crying out to God for these people. He's he's asking like God is ready to do away with them. And Moses is like, hold up, hold up. Can I just, can I throw something out there? Don't get rid of them just quite yet. He says, if you killed this people with a single blow, the nations that have heard your fame will declare, since the Lord wasn't able to bring this people into the land he swore to give them, he has slaughtered them in the wilderness. 
And then verse 17 says, so now may my Lord's power be magnified just as you have spoken. When we allow people's faith to fade, it gives them an opportunity to say, yeah, your God isn't as big as you thought he was, is he? And so we have to lament and lean in and hold people accountable. Hey, don't you remember that God said that he was going to do this? Don't you remember that God's past faithfulness in your life is an indicator of your, your current faithfulness that you have and the future faithfulness to come? Like we have to encourage them is what Moses is saying because we live in a city where 95% of people are spiritually disconnected from Christ. And if they see our faith fading, they're going to go, yeah, that's not a God that I want to serve anyways. So we have to be strong in the midst of our circumstances. Your fears should not outweigh your faith. But last, but certainly not least, in this passage, here's what we see. What affects you has effects for you. This tripped Libby up just a a, a minute last night. She was like, hold on, affect, effect, still messes me up a little bit. What affects you, circumstances, affects you, consequences, right? Your decisions have consequences, We're told that from the time we're kids, right? Hey, your decisions have consequences, or maybe I just have to tell my kids that all the time. Your decisions have consequences is the point of this. Look at verses 20 through 24 of chapter 14. Moses cries out. Moses begs and pleads on behalf of these people for God's glory, not for the people. And he says this. It says, the Lord responded, I have pardoned them as you requested. Yet as surely as I live and as the whole earth is filled with the Lord's glory, none of the men who have seen my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tested me these 10 times and did not obey me will ever see the land I swore to give their fathers. None of those who have despised me will see it. But since my servant Caleb has a different spirit and has remained loyal to me, I will bring him into the land where he has gone and his descendants will inherit it. You see, we've learned this from the time that we were kids, that our decisions do have consequences. I I think the hard thing about the life of a Jesus follower is sometimes we don't get to know what those consequences are. We don't know what has been withheld from us because of consequences from decisions that we made. We don't know what promised land was on the other side of something else in our life because of decisions that we have made over here. But God is not a God that just says, oh, no, 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 I'm going to give you everything even as you continue to disobey me in these types of ways, right? Now, as we know, and we'll talk about in a minute, Jesus covers all of that at the foot of the cross, but it doesn't mean that we don't have consequences to our actions. Um, When I was in fifth grade with Miss Upchurch, I'll never forget it. I was on a field trip, and I acted up. I did not do what we were called to do uh, or uh, told to do on the field trip. We were actually on this field trip, and I was kind of acting up with some of my other friends. I blame my friends because I just got caught in a bad crowd, right? It was just, I just, they were doing it. So I just, I wanted to be nice, you know, but we were acting out. And a couple of months later was a trip to the state Capitol on a bus. And guess who didn't get to go on the trip to the state Capitol because of the way he acted on a field trip in our city. I'll never forget it. I was so mad. Years, like bitterness, root of bitterness in my heart right now from a sub church. I don't know if you're watching Miss Up Church. <laughs> I don't even know where Miss Up Church lives. But she did a lot. I did not get to see the promised land of the state capital in Tennessee <laughs> because of my consequences from acting up in fifth grade. I knew that one. But a lot of times I really do wonder what else have I missed out on because of the way that I disobey God and do things outside of the way that he desires me to do them. The crazy thing is that these Israelites were afraid to enter Canaan with God on their side, but now they're going to have to spend 40 years wandering around without God. Like they were afraid. They had God with them getting ready to go into these stronger people. God is with them walking into the land of Canaan, and now they're going to have to walk without him for 40 years. Like it doesn't even make sense when we choose to look at our circumstances instead of our God, right? Maybe you're in a circumstance right now because of lack of obedience, but I can promise you this. What God is trying to show you in this circumstance is to trust him. Don't you know that as they're wandering around for 40 years, they had to lean into God a little bit more? 
right? They, they didn't see his presence and his glory, and they're going, man, God, I really wish you would be here right now. Like, they're leaning in. Hey, God, I, please, God, please be with us, Lord. Please, God, return. Let your presence come. I'm sorry, right? And sometimes in our current circumstances, I know one of the reasons that God puts us there is so that we can lean into him more. We have to lean into him. Maybe you're in there. And what I want you to know is that God is so much bigger than your circumstance. Like he's way bigger than you can possibly imagine in the middle of your circumstance. Your circumstance should not be viewed in light of small, unpowerful, menial God. But you should really view that circumstance in light of a big, strong, sovereign, powerful God. There's going to be a tipping point for you in this kind of negativity, in this uh, aspects of going, all right, my consequences are adding up. I mean, my, my circumstances are adding up and maybe my consequences are too, but there's going to be a tipping point where it's going to be hard to go on one side of the other. And you want to avoid negative tipping points, right? There's a really good book written by Malcolm Gladwell called Tipping Point, really recommend it. But if you look at these negative tipping points, there's four ways to avoid them. And I can tell you those real quickly. I won't have them on the screen. But the first thing is this, you need to keep perspective in mind. Like you're thinking of your current circumstance in light of today in Denver, Colorado and your current situation, but you need to be thinking from an eternal standpoint, right? Your current circumstance is so small compared to eternity, like so small compared to eternity. And if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, if they say for those people that have said yes to being a follower of Jesus, like whatever you're walking through right now, I guarantee you it's small compared to honoring and worshiping God in heaven forever. Keep things into perspective. The second thing is this. Um, critique the influences that come around you, right? So these negative tipping points can kind of come by somebody saying, yeah, your circumstance is bad. It's, it's bad. You, oh, man, I can't believe how bad that is for you right now. And you need to critique those influences. You also need to critique the things that come in that may influence the way you feel about certain things. And I'll just give you a brief example of mine. Uh, several months ago, on the same day, I received two emails that was some unsolicited free advice on my ability to communicate on Sunday mornings. Um, I always love those emails. And uh, I really don't mind them. But I got two emails the same day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. The one in the morning was, was man, it was hard to read. Um, I should give up my day job. I should do all these types of things. I'm not even going to go into all that it said, but it was hurtful and like really like went through. But then in the afternoon, you know how good God is? Someone else, independent, not knowing anything that had transpired earlier in the morning, sent me an email that said, hey, man, I can't even tell you how impactful these last several weeks have been from your message on Sunday morning in my relationship with the Lord, right? Now, here's the thing. I have to critique both of them. But I have to look and see, man, with the Holy Spirit, which one is it that is coming from a Holy Spirit's guidance and which one is not, right? Like, I don't find it by any coincidence that God would send those same emails with the same kind of subject matter in the same day. And I've got to critique that to go, is it as bad as I really thought it is? If I just left with Monday, I mean, uh, with the morning time, I would have quit my job. <laughs> but I had to critique the influences to also know that God is good in that area. The third thing is maintain an anchor point you got to have an anchor point in your life to connect with God. We call that God time. That's connecting with God every single day, whether through prayer or reading of the Bible. You have to have an anchor point in your life. Otherwise, all of those circumstances are going to continue to add up. They're going to continue to add up. If I wasn't consistent in my God time, I can't even imagine how miserable of a father, of a husband, of a dad, of a, a family member, of a uh, neighbor, of a coworker that I would be you got to maintain an anchor point. And then last but certainly not least, Moses shows us this in verses 13 through 19. You need to pray. Like you need to seek God's face. You need to intercede. And what I love about what he says there is that God listened and God actually altered what he was doing based on Moses' prayer. Avoid the negative tipping points in your life with the circumstances that are coming your way. But here's the thing that I want to close with. So as Brandon and the team get ready to come back up, when God pardons people's wrongs, their sin, there's a cost associated. For these people, it was not seeing the promised land. For you and I today, it was the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Any time that God pardons anything, there is a cost associated with it. And our cost came in the form of God's son, Jesus, being sent to live a perfect life only to be murdered and hung on a tree. 
so that because of you and I, maybe too often looking at our circumstances in too high of a way, we could seek forgiveness because of Jesus. You see, Jesus lives his perfect life. He goes on to be murdered and buried in a tomb, risen on the third day. So that if we believed in that, if we repented or asked forgiveness for living outside of the way that he desired us to live, to live outside of the wrongs and to change and correct those, he's faithful to forgive it. And then he says, if we place him as Lord of our life, man, that we have a right relationship in heaven forever. Like that's God. That's a God to view in light of your circumstance, right? View that God in light of what you're going through right now. That no matter how bad it is, he was faithful to provide the ultimate answer to whatever you're walking through in your circumstance. View that God. He was faithful to provide Jesus. And so here's really the question. How real is God to you? You've got to ask yourself, how real are you, God? To these people that were walking faithful, like he wasn't as real as they probably originally thought as soon as their circumstance got bad. But if God is real, like if if God is powerful, if he is all powerful in our lives, then man, he changes the whole situation. For For the person of faith, the one that says yes to Jesus, Obstacles are temporary because God is real. Circumstances are temporary because God is real. To the person that hasn't said yes, then your obstacles can never be overcome because God is not real to you. And it's going to be one obstacle after the other, after the other, that you do not know how you're ever going to get over it because God is not real to you. But I don't care how big, I don't care how strong, I don't care what fear comes over you, God is real. And he's overcome those things for you through the person and work of Jesus. That's God. And so take about 45 seconds And you've got to ask yourself the question, how real are you, God? I know you're going through things. And the way that you go through it will be determined based on your answer to this question. How real are you, God? Let's pray. Father, thank you for being real. Thank you for being who you said you are. Thank you for your faithfulness time and time again in our life. Father, I pray today, this morning, that you would be more real than you've ever been to every single one of us in here and watching online. God, that you would guide, you would direct, you would encourage, you would strengthen and you would be real and present to us in every situation that we have. God, we never want to view you in light of our circumstance, but man, let us view every circumstance we go through in light of our God. Strong, mighty, powerful, compassionate, forgiving, loving, kind, gracious, you name it, that's how real you are. Do a work that only you can do. Strengthen us, encourage us, be real to us in a fresh and new way. We love you and praise you in your name. Amen. Hey, if you're watching online or here this morning, and if you've never said yes to being a follower of Jesus, like if God has not been real to you until right now, the way that we say that is, I said yes. And text it. I said yes to 720-780-6969. That is our way of walking alongside of you and letting you know, hey, we've got some circumstances too, but man, don't we have a big God that can overcome those, right? 
And so text that in. We'd love to walk in that journey with you. Do me a favor. Let's stand, worship one more time before we close out after this song.